Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we've got some flight line fun. George Digweed is shooting pigeons in passage. Oh. First up, tragedy hits the Lupton household. Now, unfortunately, this week's show gets a little bit personal. I wasn't really sure whether or not I wanted to show this or share it on air. Um, but I think really it's, uh, it's only fair to, we need to show the ups and downs of what we go through and our pursuits and our passions. Roy is talking about his old female goshawk. We featured her just over a year ago when he brought her out of retirement for a last couple of hunting seasons. He had had her since he was a teenager. The old girl knew the score and was an exceptional hunter. But a few days ago, Roy lost her to a fox, even though she was surrounded by a six-foot fence and his Vizsla Atos was just yards away, she was taken from her perch. Roy feels that giving the local foxes a break has cost him dear. I think really it just goes to show that whenever you see foxes, you can't be sentimental with them. You really have got to be on top of your game and make sure that you're keeping the numbers down because otherwise they do bite you in the backside. And this, unfortunately, is the sight that I was greeted by. Just the remnants of her legs tied to her perch. And that, unfortunately, is no way for a bird and a partnership to end. Roy now has some unfinished business, and this evening the open ground opposite his house will be getting his full attention. So what we're gonna do is go and check the rifles in a minute, and then we're gonna get up, set up on the banks here with the night vision put some bait out and hope that the foxes come out. I want two rifles so I've asked Aaron to come down and give us a hand as well and then hopefully if we've got two rifles if we get more than one fox come in we should stand a chance of getting a couple if not the three. First up the rifles need zeroing. Darren has been putting and playing with some different night vision on his rifle so he very kindly whacked his uh, night vision on there and came running down but we haven't had a chance to zero it. Yeah, so we've just come out to the field and obviously we can't afford to miss any of these foxes. It has now become very personal. So we, we've had a few shots, we've got Darren on, I'm absolutely smack on. So hopefully the next time we look through the scope we shall be gazing into the eyes of a fox. This evening Darren is using a Drone Pro. We'll see more of this kit on top of his FX air rifle in airheads, but it's equally as happy on top of a centrefire rifle. Roy lamps the field before we cross it on foot. Just gone through and lamped through quickly and they're just tucked down in the thick cover. What we've got to do now is come in over the top from the other side with the wind in our favour and to our faces, try and get into position without them making us and put some bait out and fingers crossed they should just venture out. He spots three foxes in cover, but the wind isn't great. That's not all, the fog is thick and playing havoc with the night vision. We also have thermal, but no matter where we go, we're fighting the elements. Roy decides not to waste time and postpones our efforts until the following night. Obviously we were beaten by the fog last night, so this time we're going to put the bait out in front of where we know they're emerging from. I think there's a, an earth just in there. So we're going to put it just down a little bit and we're going to come further along the valley with the wind cutting along. So hopefully they won't catch our wind. As long as the wind doesn't change direction tonight, we should be in with a good chance. But they're certainly proving a lot trickier to get than I thought they would. This time we lay out some bait and settle down for a waiting game. The calls didn't provoke any reaction yesterday, so he reckons he needs to change strategy. He hopes the food will entice them to break cover. The light levels drop and there are now three rifles ready to go. For the first 40 minutes the only movement is from the rabbits and there are plenty of those about. Note to self. Then the first fox appears, its way across on the other side of the field. It makes its way along the bank but branches, hedges, fences and then finally the lack of backstop prevent a shot. It's frustrating, even more so when this Charlie is bouncing along the fence line until he spots us and is off. Then the thermal picks up two foxes over 300 yards away on a bank. Roy risks a squeak and one is interested enough to come for a look and then close enough to take the bait. 
Again, it's incredibly frustrating. Roy can't find it in the scope. Darren is also unsighted, and Chris is waiting to hear a shot from either of them. With time ticking by, the fox is off. That does not make Roy a happy bunny. We had faults and problems from the very start there, and I can't believe we've had two foxes come in. One perfectly within range, and another one actually came into the bait but we couldn't get a shot off. Well, we've been lying here for so long, the scopes had frozen up, the temperatures really dropped, and it's actually frosted on the front of the lenses, so when we went to start, that was it. We could not do a thing. So the lamp went on and the foxes disappeared. We suspect it might still be about, so Darren and Chris try to see if they can get above it. Darren calls and this time the fox just romps out of the cover. Chris drops to the ground and soon has the crosshairs on it. Please tell me you got one. Excellent. Oh, well done. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's go and have a butch. Excellent. Oh, well, one out of four. Right, should we go and get the others? What is amazing is how quickly it took the bait. That really is quite phenomenal. So David came out and put the, uh, the bait out and we had quail, guts, wings and all the general discard that we have from when we prepare the quail for the birds. And there was about 10 or 11 quails worth there. So heads and everything else and all the guts. And the fox that came in that was sitting there was there obviously for a little while whilst we were trying to sort out our kit but it's actually managed to truffle pretty much everything. All that's left is a couple of wings and a head. That is amazing. I mean, she was only there for a minute or so, and she's managed to literally clear the whole lot up. So they really, really can eat. That puts me to shame. Back at base, Darren feels the elements have been hindering our efforts. That's the end of another successful night, quite a frustrating night. Um, a lot of lessons learnt. The weather um, last two nights has been really against us. Uh, last night was foggy, misty. We had no chance of shooting at all, not under a lamp, not with night vision. Um, we could spot things with a thermal, but that was as good as it got. Um, we've come out tonight, the weather's been more in our favour, but the dew point has been so low. Um, both Roy and I scopes just missed it up instantly. And, um, but it shows the footage I got through the Drone Pro, um, shows it's a very versatile piece of kit. So we've done target shooting during the day, we've done squirrel shooting during the day, I've done rabbit shooting using an FAC air rifle and we've also been out now uh, spotted foxes uh, over night time so all in all i think it's a fantastic piece of kit very top end um, so let's hope we can get out in future nights and bag some foxes roy can't be sure if this is the fox that took the goshawk but we know it was the one that wolfed the bait a quick internal reveals a full stomach the night may not have been as successful as hoped but roy's work has only just begun one down, still a few to go there. Next, down but not out, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Animal rights activists in Scotland are asking for grouse shooting to be licensed. An outfit called the Scottish Raptor Study Group wants Scottish Environment Minister Paul Wheelhouse to introduce licences for shoots that are fit to hold them. It wants to punish shoots because it believes they kill birds of prey. Landowners and gamekeepers defend their record and insist the introduction of a licensing system would be draconian. Handguns should be legalised and licensed, says UKIP leader Nigel Farage. He says the ban on guns, which were made illegal in the wake of the Dunblane shooting, was a knee-jerk reaction and should be lifted. Here he is speaking on LBC Radio 97.3 FM. I think that we need a proper gun licensing system, which to a large extent I think we already have, and I think the ban on handguns is ludicrous. From something that's already banned to something that could be. Electric shock collars for dog training have been in the news this week, and Charlie was on ITV News, suggesting education, not legislation, is what's needed. I think uh, MPs want to ban things because they want votes, Charities want to ban things because they want donations. And at the other end of it, you've got companies who want to sell these electric training collars. And they say things like it's the must-have training accessory. It definitely isn't. I mean, I wouldn't use one myself. Um, but I don't think it should be banned. I think people should be educated. 
Flooding on the Somerset levels has had a big impact on field sports, as this video shot from a train shows. Snipe shooting's cancelled, gamekeepers are reporting more drowned badgers than they were shot in the Somerset Badger Cull, and fisheries are flooded. For a full report on fishing on the levels, watch Fishing Britain on Field Sports Channel this Friday at 7pm UK time. Australian police are hunting a crocodile that killed a 12-year-old boy. Rangers have shot two large crocodiles, but neither saltwater crocodile, one 4.7 metres and the other 4.3 metres, is believed to be the killer. They're looking for the reptiles near the spot where a boy was snatched and his friend mauled as they swam in a water hole in a popular outback tourist destination in Northern Australia. Staying in Australia and a member of the Australian Parliament has asked for a national plan on controlling feral animals. Susan Lee made her comments in response to a roomful of angry grazers at her constituency in New South Wales. She calls ferals a problem that is getting out of control. And finally, the new president of the RSPB is not a loony vegetarian. She's urging the public to follow her example of eating roadkill. Miranda Krestonikov, the new president of the RSPB and a television presenter, wants more people to source their meat not from the local supermarket or specialist butcher, but rather from the roadside. Under UK law, you can eat roadkill provided the animals have been run over accidentally and the meat is not sold. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next, let's look at what you lot have been up to. It is Hello Charlie. Here's what the world's up to this week. Hello, Charlie! As you can see, just another lovely day in Lockheed. Hello, Charlie. It's Nick Ferdinand. It's uh, 33 mile an hour winds today, and we're out in goose hunting. You guys have a good one. Okay. Hello, Charlie. Jim from Kent here. Last summer I very foolishly let Roy Lupton come onto one of my permissions to shoot foxes for Field Sports Channel. Unfortunately I haven't seen any foxes since. However, Hello. sorry Roy, you missed one. Hello Charlie, so yeah, been out with Ferret Boy Whitehead today. They don't get away from us around here. Hello, I Hello Charlie, Jake's went off, Scottish borders, sat out for a problem fox. In here two hours, nothing. phone just a sentence saying hello Charlie who you are and what you're up to then share it or email it via YouTube Facebook Dropbox or you send it you name it to Charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv next it's George Digweed on the pigeons oh, oh why were you filming me when I've just killed that one just ridiculous stalking the stories fishing for facts it's going to be one of those days. Right. Let the battle commence. George is on form here in the southeast of England, and it's not just the pigeons that are providing the sport. Crowman may be on the other side of the county, but he is in George's thoughts. There's more feathers come out of that than a crowman can get, that's for sure. And I think that what he's done to the pigeon population in this country is absolutely fantastic because he's protecting it. That's was what's commonly known in the trade as a doo-doo or a crow bird. The pressure is on for David too, who is trying to find the birds that are up there with little or no notice as they follow a flight line over a wood. Oh! It was a nice one, a very nice one. Somewhat concerned me the fact that you went on to the other pigeon. Now you finally come good and feel me killing a long one. George has put us in here for a truly sporting day. Yeah, no, I just thought that uh, it'll be something slightly different for you as well as me. Basically, I've put my hide back in the wood in this open clearing. The wood's thin enough to be able to see them coming, um, but not too thick. That you, you, you know, you can't be able to read the line and how many are coming and, and that sort of thing. And I'd far rather shoot them on a flight line than I would over the decoys. A nice day over the decoys is great fun, but. I think we've got the opportunity here of, of shooting them, you know, flying up through the wood and there's every shot in the book. It's, it's almost like shooting a driven pheasant day. But as a challenge, 
it's uh, it's you know without question ten times a day for me. I'm not interested in shooting massive bags. I just want to shoot the most challenging pigeons I can. And uh, you know I'm I'm definitely getting that with this. Very unfortunate, wasn't it? <laughs> George's hide is about 50 yards inside the wood with a few decoys along the field and wood margin. They're out there to try and focus and straighten up the flight line so the birds head right over us. But as usual it doesn't really matter. George makes life awkward for all comers and as we know when it's a good shot George does let you know. Oh. Now that is a long one. <laughs> Oh, now that was an 80 yarder. Oh, now that was a good one. George always enjoys a good shot, but he's probably appreciating them a bit more this winter. Like many pigeon shooters, he's had few decent days on the woodies. There's been so much wild food about, the pigeons are spread out which is a good thing really, because they're not getting hammered. I've been to the West Country two or three times shooting pheasants during the season, and there's been quite a lot of pigeons in that area, but it's interesting because the West Country is not normally uh, associated with big pigeon numbers, and, uh, and there was a lot of pigeons down there. A day in the hide with George is a good excuse for a catch up. We ask how the pre-clay shooting season training is going. Oh, it's great, out every day. I jog literally from the kitchen to the car of a morning, whether I need to or not, get in the car and drive to the shoot. Great. Any psychotherapy, sports therapy, anything like that? No, I had, I had a psychologist once and, and after about three months I felt I hadn't taught him anything. <laughs> now and again George says he can't oh. get enough of a line on a bird. So what does that mean? How much is enough? I don't care whether they're dropping, dying, sliding, climbing, downwind, upwind, but you just need that line to be consistent for 10 yards so that you can pick the line and come through it. See, there's one coming here. He's high. You know, it just hasn't, didn't ever had the line. He came, curled and drifted. So you've got to lock on for 10 yards? Yeah, ten, I think 10 yards, especially at this height. These aren't easy pigeons. The dogs are working hard and make some amazing retrieves. They also look as if they've learned a thing or two about setting out a pattern. The mother and daughter team have had a tough season with some big bags recorded on George's driven shoots. But he feels Nelly might be carrying a few extra pounds. His wife Kate is sure there's another very reasonable explanation. It's a hell of a dog, but it's a, good, it's a bit fat for my liking. To be honest with you, I would, I would like it a little, a little bit more lean probably as Kate would like me. I think the dog's fat, she said it's got a small head. The first few hours have been pretty wet and the birds have been in short supply. With the drier, brighter weather they're back on the move. It's like if you're on a push bike or a motorbike in the rain you find it very difficult to drive along and keep your eyes open. And I would think them flying in the rain is, is pretty much the same. Oh. You've got to be pretty alert here and look far enough back through the trees to see them coming. The unfortunate part about shooting in the wood is your eyes tend to follow the first pigeon you see and it might not be the easiest pigeon because there's probably one coming behind it that's easier, but you can't see that because your eyes have locked on and you've gone onto it. It's like then, I went onto a pigeon, finished up not shootable, and yet there was another one came through behind it that I could have easily killed. I probably missed it. Not this one, though. George has a bit of a tidy up and switches off the magnet. He feels it might be pushing the birds a little too far to either side of him. It's really only fine tuning and George is getting just the sort of sporting day he wants. I've had a fantastic day, haven't killed huge amounts. Um, I suppose I'll finish up with about 70 I suppose, which is a lovely, lovely day shooting. 
I don't necessarily want to kill them over the decoys and um, fly them up through this woods, fantastic. So, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. At the final count, George shoots 92 pigeons in the wood. His friend Simon, who is decoying in the maize field, has 167. He might not be jogging as part of his pre-season training, but, as they say, why fix what ain't broke? Didn't like that. George talking and shooting straight there. And if you want to see more films with George, click on the screen that's magically appeared up there behind me. Next, it's the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. There's a new US deer stalking channel, Whitetail Warriors. It promises its first film will turn everything you've always thought about deer hunting completely on its head. OMG, the deer are armed. No, not really. Viewer Nick Rudisall recommends Helicopter Hog and Coyote Eradication Hunt with Cedar Ridge Aviation. Last year, I offered you the same kind of thing set to Louis Armstrong's Wonderful World. This is worse, but strangely compelling. In the interest of taboo game hunting, says viewer, classic bow hunts, here is the Fred Bear tiger hunting footage. The past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Viewer Christian Hepp offers this promotional film he edited for Blaser Rifles. It shows clearly and expensively that you are able to carry Blaser Rifles while walking. If you wish to buy a Blaser Rifle and your main aim is to go walking with it, then my goodness, this is the film for you. Apparently other rifles offer the ability to shoot too. Back to what I have turned up, and here's a bit in your face, but the deer meat for dinner bloke has some good duck shooting on offer in this film, showing how they do it in South Florida. Actually similar to how they do it in the UK, but with better weather. 260 Rips shoots a pair of foxes with his 223 mounted with Pulsar N750 scope and Nightmaster 800 infrared. He calls them in with a fox pro. Nice, neat job. I love Dora and her back cam footage. Here she is trying to knock over duck on a pond. Wham bam, thank you Dora. Right next, ooh, bitch fight. Top US gun vlogger 22 Plinkster uses an iPhone camera to aim as he shoots a balloon over his shoulder. However, some people on Facebook say that he faked the shot. Here's Brothers Keepers 111 to give his views in R22 Blinksters videos real or fake. You can click on any of these films to watch them. If you are missing the fishing films and the air gun films, watch our new shows Airheads and Fishing Britain. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, it's nearly the end of the show, but before we get there, I have to recommend our other programmes. Airheads for Air Gunners was out last Thursday, and Fishing Britain for Fishermen was out on Friday. The latest episode of Airheads is out. This week's show is stuffed full of air gunning action from the UK and from the USA. From big budget ratting to Red Squirrel Rangers, we're looking at all things air powered. Jerry Moss is one of Cumbria's dedicated Red Squirrel Rangers. We follow him and his day states through the forests in pursuit of the invasive grey. Peter Zamet from the Air Gun Centre is showing us the best rifles on offer for a youngster, and air gunner and air gun world's Phil Price is talking us through some Springer safety. Throw in Jim Shockey from the SHOT Show in Las Vegas, and we've got something for everyone. Fishing Britain has three experts on the D after winter grailing, incredible footage of a pike striking dead bait with ROV TV, and then Ant shows us some of the reasons he loves sea fishing Anglesey. Watch him leap off a 40 foot cliff. There's a giant squid, and the latest fishing property prices in News and Carl and Alex feature in Hooked on YouTube along with the opening of the Scottish salmon season. Add to that the energy of Howell Morgan, and it's the must watch weekly fishing programme, out every Friday at 7 pm UK time. It's also Schools Challenge TV Week. In this show, out the second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 7.30pm, we're learning about the importance of eye testing for good shooting. We're also visiting a school in Gloucestershire which has put shooting at the heart of the curriculum. Well, we are back next week. And if you are watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere around the outside of the screen. Or go to our webpage, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or all sorts of other social media, including the constant contact box. Pop your email address in and we'll constantly contact you about our programme that's out on Wednesdays, Field Sports Britain, or Airheads twice a month on Thursdays, or Fishing Britain on Fridays, all of them at 7pm UK time. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.